Hi, so today we're going to talk about the ruby-throated hummingbirds. This is the only hummingbird that migrates up to the Ohio Valley. You may hear of some news story where an anna's or something from the west has flown or been blown in, but that's very rare. So we're going to focus on the ruby-throated hummingbirds today. This is a map. This is from www.hummingbirdcentral.com. They publish this every spring, and you can start watching it probably in March, and they'll start tracking the movement and sightings of the ruby-throated hummingbirds as they come up north. This happened to be one from March 31st of this year, and as you can see in the center, there is one little dot in Cincinnati that was reported. So I put my feeders out a couple weeks earlier than I normally do because that dot was there. I didn't get one again that I saw at least until uh, the, their normal time, which is late April, early May. Um, but hey, the map got me on my, my sugar water early. Um, so again, check this out every early summer. They do this every year, and it's kind of interesting to watch them come up. So on tax day is normally when we tell you to put your feeders out. That's easy to remember. And the recipe is four parts water, one part sugar. So for every cup of water, you do a quarter cup of sugar. You don't need to add red. There's a lot of stuff still out in the market that has red dye in it. it they don't need it. it I, I won't say it harms them, but I'm sure it doesn't help them either. So nectar is basically just sugar and water um, in nature, so that's all you need. Having said that, we do have a product uh, new this year that we're trying. It, there's a micronutrient of copper in there, and that's pretty much the only addition they've done. That's supposed to extend out the life of the food. So instead of changing it out every four or five days, which is what I do early on, um, it, it extends it out for two weeks. So we're trying it this year. Um, if it gets cloudy, I'm still going to change it. So we'll, we'll see how it does. But we do have that available. If you're just doing the standard um, recipe, then every four or five days, change it out. If it gets cloudy sooner than that, change it out. The hummingbirds have very complex tongues, which we'll be talking about here in a minute. So you want to keep them healthy. If they get messed up tongues, they can't eat, and they're going to starve. And I'm not putting pictures of that on here, but there are some pictures on the Internet, and uh, very sad. So keep it, keep the feeders clean, keep the water changed. If it gets hot outside in the high 80s or 90s, I'm doing it every other day. And especially if you have your feeders out in the full sun, you need to keep a watch of it. These feeders that are on this slide, the top um, left-hand corner, those are the older feeders that Wild Birds Unlimited had. They have since improved it, and so the bottom ones and the one on the far right are new. They're called high perch, and that high perch lets the hummingbird sit there and eat rather than have to hover, and so they stay just a little bit longer. There's also, as there was in the old ones, an ant moat, so where that hook meets the feeder, there's a reservoir for water, and if you put that stuff water in there, the ants, if they do find it and try and climb down that hook, they will stop at the water, so they will not get in your nectar. There is also, we saw, we saw them separately, but there are uh, nectar tips that you can put on the inside of the feeding ports that will not allow flying bees or flies to get into the nectar. Not everybody needs those, so those are sold separately. Um, now, the top right hand, I did put an extra ant mode on there, but it's really not for ant control. It's because the chickadees and the goldfinch kind of like to drink that water. So it's not necessary there. Somebody's going to call me out on that. Um, but uh, I just do it for the chickadees and the, and the goldfinch. So they don't really meet a lot, but I happen to get a picture of, you know, somebody wanted to eat and somebody wanted to drink. So, uh, yeah. The tongues are, this is just a real quick graphic on the tongues. So as the tongue goes into the nectar, there's actually two parts it splits, and then there's some unfurling that goes on, and then as the tongue is, is taken back into the beak, those fronds kind of curl up, grab the nectar, and then come into the beak. So, like I said, a very complex tongue, and this, this, it has to operate smoothly. So, again, keep your food clean and free of any, anything that could harm these tongues. This is kind of another rendering of the tongue going into the flower. Um, their tongues are two times longer than their bills, so people ask, especially early in the year, if they need to make the full eight ounces. Will the hummingbird be able to get it if there's only four ounces? The answer is yes. They go into very deep flowers, so they can they'll they'll do it. Um, so if you want to save a little bit on your on your sugar making at the beginning of the year, you know it's okay. They'll they'll get to it. And they do dip these tongues in at about 20 times per second, according to what I read. And then here it is kind of in, in the nectar, and you can see the unfurling. Uh, so that's the part that will grab the nectar and then bring it into the bill. 
Another thing that I thought was really neat was the light spectrum, uh, what birds, humans, and bees see. So the top line is birds, the second is humans, and the third is the bees. Um, none of us really see infrared except for cold-blooded animals and, of course, mosquitoes and bed bugs because they're looking for warmth uh, in their meals. So most of what we're going to talk about with this is, is for ultraviolet purposes. Um, the birds and the bees see ultraviolet, which we don't, but nature has really put it in a lot of flowers to help kind of guide them to the center of the flower where the pollen, um, well, to the birds and the bees, the nectar is what's important. To the flower, the pollen is what's important. So it, it, both jobs get done, and they kind of give them a little landing arrows on where to go. Um, the, now, the other interesting thing about this graph is the third line, the bee vision, stops at about orange, the orange section. So a lot of times, you know, you, we do hear all the time that the hummingbirds are attracted to red. That is true, but um, they will feed at any color flower. It doesn't matter what color it is as long as it has a lot of nectar in it. Um, Deep-throated flowers will because insects can't readily get into there and bees can't either. So um, the, since the bees don't see the red, and I've read somewhere that they actually see that as a green, unless there is a scent or an ultraviolet pattern on those flowers that would direct the bees into it, um, maybe that's another reason why the hummingbirds um, go to the red flowers is just because there's more nectar left since the insects and bees haven't found it. So again, um, they'll go to whatever flower has the nectar. At the bottom, it just shows you kind of the patterns that nature has to give them the landing pads. So the daisy, we see the white and then the yellow, and the insects and the birds see that ultraviolet. Um, the middle, we see yellow, they see that kind of red green, or I'm sorry, red white. And then on the far right, you know, again, that ultraviolet is dead center and that kind of directs them to where they need to go. Plants that they like, uh, this list, we can make that available as well offline. Um, but I've double x the ones that I know are good from, from our garden. And uh, I've also added some butterfly flowers as well. Now, hummers, again, you're going to notice in all these pictures, these are deep-throated flowers or at least not flat flowers like daisies. So the butterflies and the bees like the flat ones, the hummingbirds like the deeper ones. Um, so this is a nice mix of, of all of those just because we all like a hummingbird butterfly garden. If you can plant native, do it. Um, again, they've, they've evolved with each other. The, the animals and the, and the bees and the bugs have all evolved together. Um, Non-native plants are fine because they do have nectar. Um, and I have found some that I really, really like that aren't native and I will plant them, but if you can, do native, and if you can, put a bunch of them together. Um, I've seen a lot of gardens where it's very spread out, like one plant here and one plant there, but if it were you, wouldn't you like to be at a buffet rather than have to be traveling around for each thing? Um, so if you can get them a buffet, do it, and, and it's kind of prettier that way anyway. So the Agastache is a very nice plant. It's uh, <laughs> Technically, it's a perennial. I won't tell you it's a perennial at my house. Uh, we've planted several, and sometimes they make it, and sometimes they don't. Um, but very pretty. They uh, come in pinks, and as you see, orange. They've got some roses. I think we've even had some purples. Uh, leaves are a little different. You can have broad leaves or fine leaves, and I have to read labels on these because they really do look different. Um, but yeah, we love these. We always try and have have these out every year. The salvian sage plants. <clears throat> um, the top purple one is called black and blue salvia. It's technically it's an annual, but I have a raised bed that is on the west side of my house, and they love it there. They are a perennial there. If you are a person that can come to the store and you want one of these, I can dig some up and, and have them at the store for you. I have enough of these <laughs> and probably need to, to take down the population a little bit. Uh, but anyway, these grow probably four or five feet and very floriferous once they get going. It takes until about mid-June to really get into full bloom, but they'll uh, pretty much bloom till the frost. So great plant. Hummingbirds love them. And then the salvian sage at the bottom, uh, we have reds, purples, blues. So nice mix of colors, a lot of different sizes as far as heights as well. So good, good differentiation on these. This plant is very exciting. I found this probably eight to ten years ago. It's a cardinal climber. It's a mix of a morning glory and a cypress vine. Uh, from the bottom picture, you can kind of tell from the background that the, the leaves on these are just beautiful, period. And then once the blooms come out, which again is going to be later summer, so late, Ju late June into July and August, you get these just flaming red flowers that the hummingbirds love. 
They grow about eight to nine feet. Um, they go over my patio, which is why you get the beautiful butt shot of the hummingbird drinking up there with the sky in the background. Um, these do grow like morning glories and moonflowers, so you do have to scrape the seed, soak them overnight, and then you can plant them. And it takes them a little while to get to that eight feet where they're going to bloom. But again, they're just beautiful plants all around. Um, one of my total favorites. Bee balm is another good one. This is part of the mint family. Uh, if you are, if you check out the stem of a plant and it's square, uh, chances are it might be part of the mint family. If you break the leaf off, you'll be able to tell that with the smell. So bee balm and mandara spread exactly like mint. And if you've ever grown mint, you know it will go where it wants to. And there's very little to stop it. So plant this where you want it. Um, I wanted a huge patch of it, but I kind of forgot I had landscape cloth through some of my garden. So I ripped that out last year, and hopefully this year I'll get a nice patch as the mandara starts to spread. Um, Cambridge Scarlet, I think, is the one I do best with as far as it coming back. I've gotten a lot of uh, other ones. That pink one at the top left was very pretty. It was a, lot, a little shorter, um, but it wasn't as hearty. So I, I just I, I try them all because I like them. Um, but I'm having more success with ones that are probably more native, like the Cambridge Scarlet. Uh, there's also in, like, Beck Park, you'll see these, but they'll be kind of a light purple. I believe that's wild bergamo, and that is also part of the Mandara family. And then Cardinal Flower, this is a plant, again, it grows later, or it blooms later in the year, so late July, or late June into July and August uh, until frost, and it just has multiple stalks with these flowers on it when it blooms. The hummingbirds absolutely adore this. I can sit, you know, five to six feet away with my camera and as soon as they kind of get used to me, I can just sit there for hours and they'll let me take pictures of them. So this is a beautiful, beautiful plant. Um, it is also a perennial most of the time. <laughs> and I'm sorry, but me and my garden, you know, sometimes we have more luck than others. Sometimes it's drier. But yeah, these are these are amazing. So if you can get these good hummingbird plant as well. All right, while you're looking for the hummingbirds, you might see some of these. These are hummingbird moss. They're clearing moss. Uh, they fly like hummingbirds. They sound like hummingbirds, and they do the same flight pattern as hummingbirds with the hovering. Uh, so you'll probably do a triple take, and then you'll be like, hey, that has antenna. Hey, that has legs. Hey, it has a fuzzy butt. So you now know you've seen a uh, hummingbird moss. And I've, uh, I don't see them a lot, but you know, once a year, once every other year, I'll, I'll catch them on my, on my flowers. They really did like the mandara last year. Um, so the left hand side is a mandara and they're on a butterfly bush on the right hand picture. So nice little friends. So, um, all birds like water. Hummingbirds are no different. The, uh, picture on the top left, my neighbor, which happens to be my mother, was filling her bird bath and it was spraying out and a hummingbird started playing in the water. So, I mean, I, I was like, tell her, don't, I told her not to stop and I ran and got my camera and got a few pictures. And the hummingbird actually did that for a little bit. And then the next picture was just him kind of drying, or her drying out on a tomato cage wire. Um, I do have a mister that we do have at the store and on super hot days, I'll put it out. I don't watch all the time, so I haven't seen anybody have fun in it, but I'll direct a little bit of it, uh, into the midair and then also some of it onto leaves because a lot of times birds want to take baths on wet leaves rather than get totally dunked. So, um, yeah, I'm hoping I'll see somebody playing on it at some point, but uh, on the really hot days, I figure somebody, somebody's enjoying it. I'm just not there to see it. Um, and again, any water is going to get you, uh, birds. Um, all right. This is from the uh, PBS video. You can Google PBS hummingbird building nest and it'll probably get you this, this, um, video. The female has collected some either fur or some plant down or thistle down and she's built her nest. She'll stop around when she gets it shaped and make that little concave area for the for the eggs which actually that was very cute on the video as soon as she kind of gets it shaped how she wants it she'll get add spider webs to it uh kind of keep it all together and i think that also gives the babies uh it'll stretch out a little bit while they're growing so they'll have room to expand and she'll also put some lichen or some bark or maybe a little moss or something on the outside to keep the nest hidden i've read that hummingbirds can have two to three broods a year they might use the same nest during that year, they won't use it the year after, but if you do find a nest, uh, especially early in the year, leave it, and you may get another visitor when the next uh, brood is ready to be born. 
So, um, yeah, I haven't seen one. I think my neighbor's got one in the tree, but it's so far up, I'm never going to see it. Um, but yeah, this is, this is good and it's a fun video. So check it out. They do like to have, uh, standard perches. So if they're trying to protect, as we all know, if you feed them already, they're very territorial and they normally have a perch that they go to so they can keep an eye on their food. Um, so if you can find out where they're landing, you can get some nice pictures or just kind of, that's where you can look at first when you're coming out to see if they're up there. The middle picture is a little hummingbird next to a Spence morning glory. So they're that tiny. If you don't see them land, you probably aren't going to see them at all because they really blend in and they're just super small. The guy on the very top left corner, or I'm sorry, right corner, uh, he's the only male I've gotten a picture of with that throat in the sun on his perch. Uh, a natural perch. I'll have another one later, but um, we haven't talked about this yet. The males, if the sun is not hitting them, it looks like they have black on their chin, and, but they are red feathers, but the sun's got to hit them just right for you to get that kind of red. The females and the juveniles all just have a white chin. So if you see basically anything on the chin, it's going to be a male. And the females, early in the year, you can tell them from the males because they have those white spots, which you can see on that middle picture, and that tells you it's female. Uh, however, once the broods the first brood is out. It's kind of hard to tell them apart because juveniles look a lot like females. Uh, you might see a size difference, and that might tell you if, if, if it's a juvie. Um, but yeah, once once the babies are out, you're gonna it's gonna look like you're seeing a lot of females. A lot of them could be males, but they're juveniles. Uh, I've gotten a few pictures, which I didn't put on here, but uh, of like you can see the throat, and there's like one red feather. So I figure that's a that's a young male, and he's working on his stubble, and he doesn't quite have the full beard yet. Um, but yeah, that's hard to see. That one you got to get a picture of to see. If you don't have natural perches, then you want to give them perches. So bring it, bring it close so you can watch them, see their habits. Um, that male on the top has a, uh, he's got his territorial game face on. So he's trying to keep a, an intruder out. So he's showing his, showing his stuff. And then the female at the bottom is kind of just doing the little chit chatter that they do when they talk to you. And the last one is just preening, and that one preened for a while. And I just, I'm fascinated because that's a long bill to be that delicate of a preener, <laughs> preener with. Um, so yeah, bring them close so you can see all their their details and and their cute mannerisms. This one is uh, I have a mock orange tree, and this is a rare moment because they normally don't get this close to each other. The one on the bottom, I'm going to call her a female, was well fed and wasn't moving. I think she she ate too much. And the top one kind of like was over her and then he kind of got even with her in that middle picture. And then they started having a disagreement, but the, the, the bottom one wasn't going to move. Uh, so the other one just took off because evidently it's no fun if you can't fight. <laughs> and then this was the lady uh, that wasn't moving. Um, she let me get really close. I had my camera obviously from the first set of shots and she let me get about four feet away. And uh, so I got some really nice feather detail. And then on the, second, third, and fourth pictures, you can see that she did have a good meal because that's pollen all over her head. And, you know, she's trying to wipe it off on that third picture. And I kind of thought the last one, although I know she's not, it looked like she was sleeping and snoring. Um, so that was a cute shot. As the photographer, you get to make up your own story. So that's why I say she's snoring. All right, uh, some quick facts before we go then. So we talked about the, the markings. So the white tips on the early spring means it's female. And then um, it's it's hard to tell after after that first brood is out. The wings beat at uh, 200 times per second. The heart beats at 1,200 times per minute. Uh, pectoral muscles are 30% of the body weight, and their brains are 4.2% of total body weight. I did look it up because I was curious. Humans' uh, brains are 2.8% of our body weight. So now you don't have to look that up. Torpor is a term you might hear in relation to hummingbirds and actually other creatures, but this is how they deal with the cold. So like this year, um, Mother's Day, we had like a little freeze early in the morning. Um, the hummingbirds burn so much energy, they have to bring their body temperature down so they don't lose their body weight. Um, and so they look like they're asleep or they look like they're dead. You know, you hear stories about them hanging upside down from a feeder. They're in torpor. They'll snap out of it as soon as they kind of warm up for the day. So just leave them alone. They'll be okay. Uh, but torpor is a term you might hear. 
There was a little thing that I read that said an average man burns about 3,500 calories a day, and if you took a 175-pound man, he would have to burn 155,000 calories to equal what these little birds burn in a day. So they really do have to eat pretty much all day. You know, if they wouldn't chase each other around, they wouldn't burn so much, but, you know, Mother Nature is what it is. Um, and then this final fact, fact of the day is they live about five to nine years in the wild. We do hear story, a lot of stories about uh, people that are pretty sure their hummingbirds come back to them because they go straight to where the feeder was last year. And obviously it could be true if they live five to nine years. You know, if, if you find a favorite restaurant, you come back as well. So, uh, yeah, um, so it could very well be true that they're coming back to you. Um, so that's it. If you don't have your feeders out, get them out. Um, they are here in mass on mass and we have we've heard a lot of reports of them so enjoy them this year if you get some of the plants you know that might help bring them to your yard and we hope you enjoy them and we hope you are being well and safe and we will see you at the store uh, when we see you take care